Hello everyone! Welcome to A4.1, which is Evolution and Speciation in IB Biology. So first, let's look at what evolution even is. So evolution, and this definition is very important, is the change in the heritable characteristics of a population. Let's distinguish between heritable and acquired. Your eye color is heritable. That You can't change that. That's passed on from your parents. However, the size of your arms, you can see here in uh, the tennis player Nadal, his left arm, which is the one he uses to play tennis, is much more developed than his right arm, but this will not be passed on. This imbalance will not be passed on to his descendants. So this is acquired. So Darwinian evolution, which is the one we now know is true, says that only the heritable characteristics are passed on. So this is the only ones that count for evolution. Lamarckism considered that evolution was inheriting acquired characteristics, but we now know this is not true. So again, Lamarckism versus Darwinism. So hopefully that's clear. Let's look at all the different evidence there is for evolution. First of all, is the differences in DNA, RNA, and protein sequence. Hopefully by now you know that DNA gets transcribed into RNA, which gets translated into proteins. And so when we look at the same genes in different species, we can see that there are differences in the, in the gene. Actually, the most closely related two species are the fewer differences there will be in base sequence. Uh, you can see in the, on the slide, the Hox gene is present in most animals because it's required for development. And this can only be explained by evolution. It was a common gene that then diverged slowly. So again, there will be differences in genes and therefore there will be differences in the protein amino acid sequence. This is the first um, proof that evolution exists. So more evidence is the selective breeding of animals and plants. So humans have bred animals over thousands of years. So sheep, horses, plants, uh, also dogs, of course. Uh, and these differ hugely from the wild species that they most closely resemble. So if you look uh, at some of the wild crops, they're completely different to the ones that we eat nowadays. So how have these immense changes been achieved? Well, by repeatedly selecting and breeding the individuals which were most suited to our uses. So for example, with cows, you would take the ones that produce the most meat or milk. So this is an example of artificial selection, uh, us choosing the ones that suited our, our needs more. Um, and this can cause really, really quick evolution. So over 12,000 years that humans have been growing crops and rearing livestock, we've completely changed the fate of some species. More evidence, homologous structures. So homologous structures are features which have a very similar structure. So anatomically, they're very similar and they have a similar position as well, even though they have a different function. For example, the pentadactyl limb. Uh, all amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals have the pentadactyl limb. But these all exist in different ecosystems, right? For example, the bat flies, whereas the human does not. But we have a very similar structure. Why? Well, this can only be explained in one way. It's that it's inherited from a common ancestor, but then we evolved in different ways uh, because we became adapted for different functions. So this is evidence that evolution um, is real. Now we have the opposite to homologous structures. So as we said, homologous structures are structures that are very similar anatomically, but perform different functions, such as flying and walking. But then we have the opposite, which is structures which have the same function but are very different structurally. So for example, when you look at the tails of fishes and whales, when you actually study them in detail, they're very, very different. Um, so again, they perform the same function, but they have different origins. These are called analogous structures. So again, homologous structures and analogous structures. So how can you explain analogous structures? Well, it it's, makes sense if they come from different ancestors, but they adapted to have the same function. So this is convergent evolution, okay? So how do you know if a structure is analogous or homologous? Well, you can look at clades. Remember clades? If almost all organisms in the clade have the same characteristic, it's probably homologous because it comes from the same ancestor. If it's not the case, it's probably analogous. Amazing. So moving on, let's look at speciation. This is going to be quite a long section of this topic. So the only way for species to form is for two populations of the same species to become separated so that they can't interbreed. And you also need natural selection to act differently on both. We'll look at this in a sec. 
hopefully they'll diverge gradually over time, and at one point, if they have the chance of interbreeding, but they don't, they will be considered separate species. So it happens by splitting of pre-existing species. Let's look at this in a bit more detail. So the actual terms for this are reproductive isolation and differential selection. So reproductive isolation is for them to not interbreed, right? Why? Because if they interbreed, they will continue mixing the genes and the species will not divide into two. But you also need differential selection. Now, we'll look at reproductive isolation in a sec. But what's differential selection? Well, you need selection to act on it in different ways, because if it acts in the same way, it'll keep being the same species, right? So what factors contribute to differential selection? Climate, predation, and competition. For example, climate. If you live in the same temperature, you're not going to be adapted to have more fur uh, than the other population. However, if one moves to a colder climate, they might start to adapt to have more fur because those that do survive in the colder weather. Does this make sense? I hope so. Again, if it doesn't, mm, I can explain it further in the comments if anyone has any questions. But now let's look at reproductive isolation. So as I said, this is the species being separated so that they can't interbreed. The most common cause is geographical isolation. This can be that the populations get split between a mountain range or an ocean um, because then they physically can't interbreed. Uh, for example, you can see in the picture um, that in the Congo River, bonobos and common chimpanzees um, are different species now. But it's thought that the, the way this worked is that in the past, the water level fell very drastically. And so chimpanzees crossed temporarily. But then as the water levels rose again, they became separated. And then those chimpanzees became bonobos. So this is a perfect example of geographical isolation. It's probable that on both sides of the river there were different conditions of climate predation and competition leading, leading them to become two separate species. So hopefully that makes sense. I know it's a bit tricky to understand. Moving on to the HL content, we're going to be looking at the types of reproductive isolation. So as we said, the most common type is geographical, right? You just get split geographically. This is allopatric. So there's two types of reproductive isolation, allopatric and sympatric. So allopatric is you get split geographically. Sympatric is when you're in the same geographical area. So this is much less common, to be honest. But how can it happen? Well, it can be either behavioral or temporal. So behavioral can be, for example, differences in mating rituals. That's why I have the peacocks there. So if you have different mating rituals, then you won't interbreed. Temporal can be, for example, different timings for the life cycle stages. Uh, and that way, the reproductive time, the mating season, will not match. For example, the North American leopard frog and the bulldog frog mate at different times of the year, meaning they can't interbreed with each other, and that's how they became separate species. So hopefully this makes sense. It's just different ways in which species are not allowed to interbreed, meaning that they can slowly, if they're under different selection, diverge and become two separate species. Great. So now I want to talk about adaptive radiation. So adaptive radiation is by definition a pattern of diversification in which species that evolved from a common ancestor occupy a range of ecological niches. All right. So what does that mean? So adaptation, the word adaptive. So adaptation are characteristics that make an individual suited to its environment. And radiation just refers to spreading out. Therefore, adaptive radiation is a pattern of diversification in which species that come from the same common ancestor, as the definition say, occupy different ecological niches. And this contributes a lot to biodiversity. Why? Because it minimizes competition between species. If they adapt to different conditions, then they, they're not competing with each other. A good example of this is the Galapagos finches, which you can see in the image. So 14 species have evolved from the same common ancestor in the Galapagos Islands. But because they have different um, differences in their beaks, they've become adap adapted to different food sources. So they don't compete with each other because they're using different uh, food. So hopefully this makes sense, right? Um, if they can exploit ecological niches, as it's called, for example, a different type of food that's not being exploited by other species, you can have more biodiversity without competition. Hopefully that's clear in simple terms. Great. So now on to hybridization. So hybridization uh, is when two um, members of a different species uh, interbreed. So interspecific hybrid, hybrids require crossbreeding of different species. For example, the mule, which you can see a picture there, is a crossbreed of horse and donkey. However, What's going to happen? Interspecific hybrids are mostly going to be sterile because the donkey and the horse have different chromosome numbers. 
then the mule cannot reproduce with either. This is also used uh, by plant breeders, breeders to create new varieties all the time. Uh, and it can also happen naturally sometimes. Uh, so if, if donkeys and horses overlap in an ecosystem, they could interbreed naturally. However, in evolutionary terms, this is a waste of resources. Why? Because again, the, the interspecific hybrid is not going to reproduce because it's sterile. So it's not going to produce any more organisms. And again, therefore, a waste of resources. So there are barriers in place for hybridization. And these are quite important to remember. First, the zygote normally dies during development if it's a hybrid. And also, there's, that's why there's courtship behaviors, right? For example, you can see that they're the birds of paradise. They have very, very specific courtship behaviors, which make sure that they don't interbreed with the incorrect species. However, sometimes the courtship behaviors overlap, and that's when hybrids can, can be produced. Great. So, again, there's two types uh, leading on from hybridization. There's two types of abrupt speciation. One of them... Um, as we mentioned, is hybridization. So if you if you create uh, crossbreed two different species, you create a hybrid, that's a new species. Another one is polyploidy. So a polyploid organism has more than two sets of chromosomes. So if you remember, we have 46 chromosomes, which is two sets of 23. A polyploid organism has more than two sets, so it can have three sets or four sets. This can happen if a cell duplicates its chromosomes without dividing, and if this happens, it's called an auto tetraploid because it's divided, uh, sorry, not divided, it's duplicated its chromosomes by itself. So auto, right? Self. And these normally have very, very low fertility. However, this is speciation because think about it. If suddenly you have four sets of chromosomes, you are, according to the biological species definition, a different species to the original diploid. Another way that you can have uh, tetraploids is if this duplication that we talked about, so the chromosomes duplicating, happens in a hybrid, because this creates an allotetraploid, because you'll have four sets of chromosomes from two different species. Imagine a mule, right, has duplication of its chromosomes. It'll have two sets of the horse and two sets uh, of the donkey. So it'll be an allotetraploid, two different sets, but four in total. And again, this is a new species since they can't interbreed with either of the parent species. This this actually, this type of polyploidy is very, very common in a lot of plants. For example, the one that's there, Persicaria, um, it's called knotweed, uh, knotweed, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, it happens constantly that it becomes polyploid. Great. So right before we leave, let's do one recap question, which is what types of reproductive isolation are there? And I'll let you think about it. Pause now if you want to do so. But I'm going to give out the answer, which is B. Remember, there's geographical, temporal, and behavioral. Geographical is allopatric isolation, and temporal and behavioral are sympatric isolation. Go back a couple of slides if you don't remember, because I explained it there. But yeah, so if you have any questions about this or anything else throughout the video, make sure to leave it in the comments and I'll respond and do my best to do so. And if not, I'll see you next week for A4.2.